how many people are in PL or verification are, are convinced that's a good thing? Okay, then the first uh, few slides will go through very fast. Software verification is important. It's not enough to verify applications, but you want to verify also the underlying operating systems and file systems and machinery. Uh, because even if you verify your applications and then you have a bug in an underlying system, um, it could compromise the guarantees that you have about your applications. Yep, cool. Uh, okay, where does verification stand? They're like, yeah, I don't want to offend a bunch of people, but like um, in interactive PR proving, I think these are two of like some of the notable successes in the area, at least. I guess that's hard to <laughs> argue against. Uh, so concert, which is an optimizing C compiler, and SEL4, which is a verified microkernel. And I think that one reason these projects are quite successful is because they looked at real code. They didn't just pick a toy problem, um, do a bunch of theory, and then say, ah, look, it works on my toy problem. Uh, uh, uh. Great. And another thing they didn't do is they didn't look at the real world problem, but then like, really expand their trusted computing base. So just decide to use a bunch of untrusted um, verification tools and, um, and rely on those. So they did not compromise between the efficiency of the code that they're either verifying or generating in the case of a compiler uh, and between uh, and on nor on trust. So they're still just using um, an interactive theorem prover with a tiny kernel. And that's more or less all they need to trust. Okay, so what did they compromise on the when it was an enormous amount of effort? Both of these projects are still an enormous amount of effort. Uh, so it took several PhD students, uh, research engineers, uh, for 10,000 lines of code for SEL4, it took about 25 person years to verify that. Um, that is not scalable. That is like verifying things by brute force. Um, so how do we scale up verification to other systems components? I think ver verifying every component by brute force would be very, um, uh, I don't know, like not very feasible. Okay, so what do we wanna do? We wanna reduce the cost of uh, verifying software without compromising on efficiency or trust. And the idea here is at least like the theme that I've been going through um, throughout my career is to focus on one domain at a time. So not to try to do too much or to have restrictions, not in the sense of domain specific languages, but like in the sense of that is enough to do what we're trying to do. So let's 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 not um, increase ex expressivity too much. Uh, in the past, well, I've worked on algorithms and graph algorithms, also worked on file systems, device drivers, and um, still working on device drivers, and hopefully at some point in the future, be working on network protocols, maybe. Um, so here's a, here's a bit of a like split view of things. So you have code and you have data or data structures. And when you're doing verification, you want to deal with algebraic data structures. Uh, you also want to preferably deal with math mathematical functions because they're easy to prove things about uh, equationally. And when you're doing implementation, not everyone who's doing implementation compares this, but uh, you ideally still want to deal with algebraic data structures, but you do want fine grain control over the bits and bytes in memory if you want to, if you care a lot about efficiency, because um, yeah, depending on the memory layout of your data, uh, your algorithms and implementation may or may not be efficient. Um, I think a lot of systems programmers also prefer imperative um, programming languages or programming languages that are closer to how the machine works because again then they do uh, they can do all these tricks um, about um, like efficiency like efficiency tricks right that you can't necessarily do in a classic functional language because you don't have too much control over how the compiler turns that uh, compiles that down to machine code um Okay, so let's look at the map, point the map symbols and move on. Um, okay, so I want to prove things about functions, not about imperative code and uh, memory and guards. Um, so yeah, usual way of doing this is you have some sort of refinement or abstraction theorem between the two, depends which direction you look. Uh, so you want to say, 
anything I prove about some functions is also true of some imperative code. You have just a, either a general theorem or a generated theorem saying that, and then you can prove things about functions and have the result be true for the imperative code. Now, okay, what about data structures? Ideally, in an ideal world, you want to be able, well, if you want both the control and the abstract view, you want to be able to implement your data structures as uh, algebraic data structures, and then maybe have a declarative language to specify how to lay out this data structure in memory, and that could guide the compiler to do it for you. And in an even better world, it would give you a, a proof that it did so correctly. So it's laying out uh, all your um, algebraic data types in the way that you specified. Okay, so these are two projects that are related that I've been working on for quite a long time. I don't know, 2013, I think it started. The, so this is, I'll um, talk about Cogent, which falls in this world, and then Dargent, which falls in the, uh, in the data, uh, data structure world. So uh, Dargent, what, 2018, I think, 2017, something along these lines. And uh, yeah, we're finally at least done with, uh, with some version of it. Um, Okay, so here are the things that we like to uh, uh, think about uh, functional languages, type systems, certifying compilers. Uh, why do we like functional languages? Because I think they increase productivity, and that's usually very debated by systems folks. Uh, but like, I think they increase productivity, but at least writing the code and maintaining the code. Um, whether they give you uh, the expressivity to write efficient code or not is a separate point. Uh, and they also uh, ease verification. That's, that's, that's a bit less debatable. Type systems, they can automatically enforce safety and security properties that you may want to have. And you get a compiler shouting at you more often, which is good. Um, OK, certifying compilers, they automate a large portion of the ver verification. Namely, you have an abstract language. You have the low-level code. If your compiler generate, generates proofs that the two correspond, that one is the refinement of the other, uh, then um, you can prove things on top of the more abstract representation. Uh, okay. Um, okay, so at some point in the past, um, verifying file systems was posed as a grand challenge. And why is it a grand challenge? Because it's a large amount of code. So each file system is about 5,000 lines of code and Linux has about 50 of them and they keep getting updated. So good luck verification folks keep keeping up, right? Um, if you can't verify that by hand. So what we want is a good way to reduce the cost of verifying these. And what we did is we came up with a language called Cogent, which is a functional language with some sort of linear types or uniqueness types, so some ownership type system, and the certifying compiler that generates code and proofs. Um, okay. Um, uh, we implemented two file systems in that language, uh, and we verified key operations of one of them. So uh, um, file system uh, key operations are uh, reading and writing. Uh, fancy writing is called sync. So writing and doing some synchronization. Uh, so one of the read ones and one of the write ones. And we rely yeah, on automation. Uh, what are linear types? Um, I don't know if Phil Wonder can tell you, but uh, there's basically, so you have variables and variables that have a linear type must be used exactly once. Um, why is that something we want in our system? Because if you have a language with a linear type system, you could give it a functional view and an imperative view, and these will coincide. So imagine every pointer you use or every pointer you have, you can use exactly once. Then you can imagine replacing the pointer use with a value of that pointer in memory. And then you know you're never going to use that pointer again. So uh, you could just like get rid of memory altogether, right? So once you've done that, you just don't need to think about memory anymore. Yeah. You mentioned the word you. You mean it in the technical sense or in the um, sense? I don't mean in that sense. I uh, not. What are your views? What are your views? 
Okay, uh, then uh, not in the technical sense. Uh, uh, I mean, you can view it as you can see it as a functional language, or you can see it as an imperative language. You can give it a functional semantics and imperative semantics and prove that the two coincide. Um, I don't know, like all the PL people took all the names of things yeah. and words and used them for stuff, and I just don't know how to talk anymore, but like. Computer scientist, uh, put a bigger pot around it, fine. Um, yeah, so like, yeah, just. Uh, okay, so if you can have a functional semantics and an imperative semantics, this is all new for you, Liam, you're going to miss out. You know? <laughs> Uh, functional imperative semantics, and you know the two coincide. You know memory is do not doing anything weird, so the language is memory safe. You get memory safety as a uh, as a result uh, as a side result of the type system. Another nice thing is you get a nice shallow embedding in higher order logic, and that's intuitively because you're not dealing with like if you want to embed C in uh, logic, you'd usually use a monad and talk about state. But here you don't need to talk about state anymore because you have a functional definition of the language. So you have a pure um, uh, function in higher order logic that's not doing at least explicitly the state threading. Um, okay. New features, I know this is like just bits and pieces of stuff, but you have the typical uh, Latin if statements that you have in a functional language. Uh, Cogent also has records. So we define like very careful take and put operations so that you, uh, can deal with taking specific fields from a record or putting in a specific field because once you take something from a field now it's used can't use it again but you can use all the other fields so there's some careful handling going on there but yeah is, uh, yeah so type inference? Um, um yeah it's a type inference is not complete but we have some type inference yeah is it Roughly based on the thing we know with that number, so we will just go that box. So we can train the case with the strain Right. And right, but the compiler does type inference. Since we have a certifying compiler, um, we don't have to verify the type inference algorithm to get, um, we just need to check whether the um, uh, a certain program has a certain type of the compiler says it does. And that's what we do. We do have like a proof in progress buried somewhere about like verifying the type inference algorithm, but that's not part of the main project. That's just the side. Let's verify that thing. So user interface to writing programs. It's a it's a usability thing, yeah. Like without type inference, uh, people would have to write too many linear types yeah. or uniqueness types or whatever you want to call them. Um, okay. Yeah, that. so cogent is a functional language, but it does not have recursion. Well, it does, but like, okay, for the purpose of this talk, it does not have recursion. It does not have iteration either. So how do you do anything? Okay, we have a foreign function interface uh, to see. Fortunately, systems folks, uh, at least the ones writing file systems, don't use that many data structures. So they had a few data structures like uh, arrays, uh, red black trees, um, and what we could do is we could write like the C code or template C code, um, define these data structures once and for all, define iterators over these data structures, uh, and then you can uh, define them as abstract types in cogent and use these iterators. And the idea is, okay, yeah, uh, why are we doing C again? Um, well, it's quite easier. So, um, if you, so these data structures are reused across a lot of systems. And the idea is it wouldn't be too easy to verify them, but you could verify them once and for all and um, and reuse them. So the cost of their verification is amortized across various systems. Or at least the story went like that for a very long time. And finally, 2022 was it? I don't know, years passed fast, but like we finally verified like some uh, like one uh, like the arrays, array implementation in C and showed that you could compose um, um, cogent and C code and get uh, a whole verified system. It's actually pretty, um, but yeah, I'll talk, maybe I'll leave that for later. Uh, how did you find that? Yeah, oh, okay. I wanted to highlight small in red and then get back to that later. 
So the idea is write most of your code in Koja and Koja will simplify your verification. Write a small part in C and then uh, verify that manually, but reuse it many times. We'll get back to this. Okay, but here's a figure just to break the text. Uh, so you have a certain fine compiler. Input is a program, let's say an entire file system. The output is efficient C code and uh, higher order logic specification. And most importantly, a proof uh, linking the two. So a proof that the C code is a refinement of the higher order logic. So any behavior that happens in C also happens in higher order logic. Um, another side, so, so the main thing is the refinement proof, the main uh, thing that we like. But one other side thing that you get from this refinement proof is memory safety because you're going from imperative to functional again. Okay, actually, this is a bit more accurate view. So this is the, uh, actually, I need an arrow here too. Uh, sorry, an arrow from the C ADTs going to the certifying compiler. So, so you want to write some cohesion code, some C code, and they can use each other back and forth. I order functions in C. No one questioned my iterators in C, but that's fine. So uh, template C. So, yes. What, what's the context of C are you using? Using comp serve or something? Where you, uh, where, so this work is done in Isabel. Uh, it's just a passive move. Okay, so this. Uh, uh, 20 seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can tolerate this for 20 seconds. I hope everyone else can too. Uh, no, yeah. Okay, okay. good. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> You're so funny. Yeah, anyway. Uh, so, um, I think I need another one. Uh, anyway. Would template fix C? Uh, no, uh, uh, we use the C parser that was used in FEO 4 because that's formalized in Unibus. So that turns C into a deep embedding of C in um, Isabel. And then uh, they have another tool, which is not part of Cogen, but that we adapted to use with Cogen that abstracts C into uh, monadic C and uh, gives us a memory model that is more. Uh, 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 convenient reason about and link to the cogent one. Um, is there a proof that the um, yes that the, this model refines some sort of more, more certified C C model like uh, a concert or or Severus or it's a different C semantics for C right it's a right right so, yeah. it, so the C part of part of C into the deep embedding C in Isabel and this looks as close to C as possible. So this is just a very right. So we're from um, I don't know. So Tomsu has has a tool that um, that certifies um, something something about the C and C parse and like I don't know. And then you compile down the C to the GCC and linking the GCC uh, assembly to the C that's sparse. So that gives some sort of some sort of guarantee about the that what the parser is doing is not too bad, but that increases the CCD a bit as well because you use FMT and whatnot. But uh, yeah, like the parsing, there's not much verification there. So we are trusting the C parser that is correct. The abstraction between the C parser and the monadic embedding that we're linking to both, uh, that is uh, ver verified. So the this tool that does the abstra abstraction gives up proofs that uh the abstraction is done correctly. Does that make sense? Not quite. So, so we have your monadic value, yeah. and then we have some assembly code that you get to compile that. Yeah, this thing is about assembly. So so this, but our, uh, like, I'm, I'm bottoming at C. So there needs to be some semantics for this uh, monadic yeah. computation. And how do I have any idea? So, so you have the semantics of C in Isabel that the SEO4 folks use. Okay, so and that is the one we use. So we use that semantics. And what do you know about that semantics? How do you relate to other semantics? Uh, I am not entirely sure okay. that they disagree in certain places, uh, and that neither of them support the full C language, mm -hmm. uh, but that they support enough of it for these projects, and that's it. Okay. So, 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 uh, whether it's concert, so concert is. Yeah, like you're verifying the compiler from a semantics of C to some low level semantics, mm -hmm. and you trust that that's the semantics yeah. of C. And here 
we have a different value of C and Isabel that we did not come up with ourselves, and that is also part of like, the semantics is kind of part of the so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right. So, um, okay. So, the, so this proof is really like you have a bunch of la layers and a bunch of proofs in between that I don't present here. But um, yeah, one of them is like parsing that into Isabel using the C parser, using Autochorus, and then a bunch of layers that we have for the Cohesion project. Um, okay, and you have the ADTs implemented in C and linked to that cogent code, and you uh, and the higher order logic that is set generated is a proof about the entire system. Assuming like parts of the assumptions in the final theorem is that everything you used in every function you used on these abstract C types is correct, and then we can discharge these assumptions manually, and we did that for one data structure. Um, last year. But the question is, how painful are these proofs? Is this just verification of um, the data structure? And the answer is no. It's verification of the data structure plus a proof that the data structure respects Cogent's type system. So um, it doesn't mess up our framing rule or frame rule or uh, our, I don't know. <laughs> um, or in other words, um, these data structures are abstracting cogent and they're given a cogent type and you want to make sure that the type they're given, uh, they're truthful to that type, right? Okay. Uh, why do I have this? Never mind. Forget this. What is that anyway? Uh, doesn't say much. Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah. Refinement theorem. Okay. So how does the certification work? That's a big tactic in Isabel that just syntactically goes over um, the program, one of the programs, the Cogent program in that case, and it's kind of like as deterministic as can be so that uh, so that it succeeds uh, a lot of the time or most of the time, right, for features we support. Uh, okay. The theorem that we want and the theorem that we get is that when the C executes to a value, higher order logic executes similarly. Uh, so anything that we prove about higher order logic, we get automatically that it holds for the C. Uh, and yeah, performance of the generated C is comparable to 100 and C. So uh, except for some really bad corner cases where the type system gets in the way um, is, is, um, is similar to 100 and C. Uh, why do I have that? Like, I, I don't know what's happening, but that's fine. Uh, okay. Uh, Okay, uh, file system, let's say Bilby, because that was interesting. It's the one we did some verification on. That was about 4,000 lines of cogent and 2,000 lines of C. Uh, for the cogent parts that we initially verified, the effort was about a third of the verification compared to SL4. So that's really good. Take that with a grain of salt because that's boring file system code rather than operating system code. Uh, I don't know how boring operating system code is, but. Uh, Maybe less boring, I don't know. Um, yeah. Look at that bit. Set small C, 2,000 lines. That's about a third. Uh, can we improve on that? Yeah, let's first think about where these 2,000 lines of code come from. Uh, so systems programmers, yeah? So the efficient in the real side. Um, how, how, how efficient is it compared to the- The because I don't understand enough about benchmarks. According to people who did benchmarks, so within about 10% of the handwritten, the handwritten one. I'm not sure how accurate that result is because uh, it varies slightly every time you ask. But uh, uh, enough for the system folks to be happy with it, uh, with the usual grumbling every now and then. But like, yeah, 10%. Uh, yeah, 10%. I'll say I was told 10%. Uh, yeah. The system does. It doesn't crash. Oh, ah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, all of that is about. Um, so there was other file system verification work that started at basically a, a, a not higher order logic calculus of uh, inductive construction, the definition, and went all the way up. To, to the uh, uh, sorry, and went all the way up. So uh, they developed um, what happens if your system's cr uh, system crashes, a high level functional spec on top of logic, basically. 
uh, in this project, we went all the way down, which they didn't do. You can imagine in a world where everyone uses the same semantics of things, one could compose these two results and, uh, uh, and get all the way down and down to C and all the way up, but uh, yeah, beside the point, yeah. Okay. Uh, how do systems folks tend to uh, link their systems? You have a file system, you have an operating system. How do you put the two together? Uh, what they call maybe, I don't know, formally or informally glue code. Uh, so uh, marshalling, unmarshalling of data structures. Uh, one system uh, expects data structures to be laid out in one way, another system in another way. They copy, yes, they do copy, which is inefficient. Uh, one structure into the other st structure with a lot of very, really nasty tricks about bit shifting and whatnot uh, that tries to make that slightly more efficient. So this gluing code of like, you have some data structure, you wanna turn it to a different data uh, uh, laid out in a certain way, you want to turn it into one laid out in another way, tends to add inefficiency to the system because of this marshalling, unmarshalling, or whatever they want to call it. It is extremely ugly and error prone. I would never verify it by hand because I'm a sane human being. And um, yeah, it's tedious, so it's easy to get wrong. Can we do better? Yes, we can. So how can we do better? We want to shift towards more cohesion, and we want a good verification interface between the cohesion and C. We also want to eliminate all this marshalling and marshalling of code. So we want to give them the layout that they want, the layout that they choose to have their data structures laid out in, not the one chosen by the compiler. So imagine you use a C compiler or a cohesion compiler. I put these in the same bucket. Um, and you want to use nice data structures, not arrays of why do they use bit fields and arrays of bits in memory? Because they want this low level control and they can't get this low level control all the time, except that they really know some very uh, implicit knowledge about how the compiler compiles things and try to use this, but have no guarantee about it. Um, so how do they get this low level control? By like giving away the algebraic data types, right? Use of algebraic data types, uh, or by using the algebraic data types and doing this marshalling and marshalling. Um, so we don't want to do either of these things. Um, ah, okay, we already talked about the foreign function interface, but okay, so marshalling, among, marshalling, we can think of that in this context as matching up cohesion data types and C data types, right? So you have some C data types, cohesion data types. Uh, you could either always implement things in cogent, and that would be fine. You wouldn't do a lot of copying, but uh, that wouldn't integrate with C. You could copy everything, but that wouldn't be efficient. You could do conversion by cost. <laughs> okay, no verification complaints, uh, no PN complaints about cost. Uh. Okay, so what if you took a data structure, laid it out in one way, and then pretended it was a different data structure and then moved on? Uh, why do we have a problem with that? because you can't take an orange and pretend it's an apple and treat it as an apple and move on, right? Except if it's a yellow apple, like you could take an, a, an apple and treat it as a yellow apple and move on, only if you actually know it's a yellow apple. What if you're told it's a yellow apple, then you can treat it as a yellow apple. So cost is not inherently bad, it's only bad because we lack information, right? So if I'm told, about, uh, if I'm told and have a guarantee about how things are laid out, I could just deal with the layout directly, right? Or even pretend it's a different data structure if the layouts happen to match, like with some proofs in between. Okay. So what is Dargent? Dargent is more recent work that we finally um, wrapped up some bit of uh, earlier this year. Um, it's a data layout sophistication language with uh, verified data refinement from the algebraic types down to the bit level. And by bit, I mean, you can specify bit by bit how things are laid out. Uh, but you do that specification in a high level way, abstract way. Uh, let's look at, yeah, so you have algebraic data types in cogent. You also have a specification of how these lay, uh, data types are laid out in memory. You pass both of these to the compiler and that guides the compiler on how to lay things out 
into bits and bytes and write, run them on some device. So this is important. It's also important. It could be useful for file systems, but it's particularly important for device drivers because in my very abstract view of device drivers, they're uh, um, a piece of code that takes out some data in some certain form, mumbles it or shifts it or does some uh, um, operations on it, including mumbling and shifting, and then puts it out in a different form. So if you can specify input form and output form, these operations could become trivial, right? Of like, just take this data structure to get these fields, uh, uh, assemble them, put them out. Like it becomes really simple. Okay, and you also want to, to not give, give away the certification. So the proofs in Isabel. What did we have before with Cogent? What do we have now with Argent? So Cogent you had, so this is how, this is the syntax for a record. You could have a field, a number, um, like a bounded integer the jar of size 32, for example, and you'd access that field. So you'd get that field from the record um, just by saying uh, if the records are r.a and r.a is equal to some value to set the field. So you had, I call that an algebraic view because you can set and get fields without talking about bits and bytes. In C, you also have kind of algebraic types. So you have uh, structs and unions, for struct, for example, you can have, again, a field, you'd access it, get and set the field um, in the way uh, that you'd expect. Uh, so see with Dargent, uh, what if you want to talk about where that field is laid out, then we generate, the compiler would ideally generate getters and setter functions for each field in a record, let's say, and, um, as specified by the layout. So if you say put that in bit number five, so the compiler would do the computation, set it and get it at the right bits and bytes. And um, the person doing the coding would still be able to use it, the get and set operations and not talk about the bits and bytes directly. Here's a more colorful example with not so nicely rendered um, text. Um, okay, so let's say you have this is uh, this is a record. You have a inside it. There's a record with two fields, a pointer, a variant. This is how we write the layout. So uh, let me move this somewhere. Um, remind me. Ah, fine. I'm talking. So sure. Um, okay. Uh, so this is how we wrote the type beforehand and the compiler decided how to lay that type out in memory or how to convert it to C and then C would lay it out in memory. So um, before it was just a struct in C and however C laid it out, that's how it's laid out, uh, the compiler. Now you have, a, a, as the programmer, you can write the records uh, layout by saying, for example, um, well, I had this record. I want the first four bytes, uh, capital B is bytes, to be. Um, uh, I want X to be the first uh, to be four bytes, and then I want Y to be one bit after that, and then I want to put the pointer. Uh, it's the pointer size, whether it's thirty-two or sixty-four. We can define that and adapt it, but like, it's the pointer type. So however pointer, however many bits a pointer takes, and put it starting bit byte eight. So then we decided to put the pointer at the very end of the structure. And then let's say we have a variant. The variant has two um, alternative alternatives. Um, so you have a tag that tells you which alternative you're taking. So we need one bit for the tag. And you're saying if the tag, uh, if the value of the tag is zero, then layout X to be starting the second bit, uh, second byte into that substructure, uh, uh, sorry, uh, it to be two bytes, one byte into that structure and set Y to be one byte, one byte into that structure, uh, starting at five bytes. So this is very verbose. We have a little bit of syntactic sugar to hide some of that or make it nicer to work with, uh, but it is elaborating that basically as a systems programmer, uh, you could have a data structure, you could, define down to the byte level and bit level um, how you want to lay it out. And we decided to extend the cohesion language to uh, support um, the bit type and like uh, 
yeah, one bit, three bits, so n bit type up to a reasonable amount. So up to, uh, let's say, 64 bits or whatnot. Um, so with this combination, people can really define how they want things laid out. And also, <laughs> the C semantics, talking about C semantics that we were using, uh, our C semantics does not support um, unions. Uh, they haven't used unions in FE anymore. We have not, we could not use unions unions here either. So it meant when we compiled down variant types, we uh, compiled down a variant into a struct that includes a field for the tag and fields for each alternative. That is a very big space for a variant. Um, things should be able to we should be able to lay them out uh, on the same. Um, Can you pack the bits so you can pop the out there? You've got these two bits that are in separate bytes. <laughs> Yeah, this is just a representation of what. Uh, can I do what trace that was pack? Pack the bits into one byte. You've got two bits there. You can stick them in one byte. You just, you could. Uh, how would you specify that? Right. So you would, instead of saying at five bits, you would say at four bits. Then it four bits in one, four bytes in one bit. Uh, four bytes in one bit, yeah. Uh, so uh, here we say, uh, uh, so it's basically at specified. So here it says starting at the fifth byte. Oh, uh, so I put them. Yeah, 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 exactly. So you could just calculate that in bits or just say in four bits and one byte. I don't remember the syntax for that, but okay. yeah. some canonical thing on the right, some thing on the left. If you want to I think there's some syntactic sugar to say uh, and next, put that next or stuff like that. Uh, like if you don't say add five, I, I'm not entirely sure about the syntax because I don't deal with it much, uh, but uh, syntactic sugar, pick your favorite, uh, ask someone. Like to implement it, uh, you have it. Like I don't really care. Uh, yeah. Okay. I think this is cool. I think this is even cool for people who want to use C. I think I want to look into a variant of Dargent for C. So I think even if you're using C and you're using structs and uh, unions, this same idea could apply. Would be nice to have a data. Uh, description language for C, specifying how to a C compiler, how you want your data to be laid out. So um, this was implemented for Cogent, but I don't think the ideas there are um, specific to Cogent or to the type system in any way. Okay, so what is new? Now we have this bunch of getters and setters. Well, we still have our refinement theorem, but remember that the C we're generating now is much lower level than the one that we uh, generated before, right? Uh, because uh, now we have this array of bits in memory, we have these getters and setters, we want, we have to make sure that that is linked to the high level uh, theorem. I thought that this, when this project started, I thought that it would be really challenging to adapt this proof. Uh, it was not as challenging as I thought. And I think that's because uh, we could verify, uh, like we had nice lemmas about the getters and setters and we could compose this with the existing tactics that generated the proofs. Um, I was really worried that we'd have to go to a lower level of um, like memory layout and deal with that, not with a nice one that Otokoros gives us. Uh, that was not the case. Uh, so, okay, so we still have the same theorem, but for lower level code, uh, we want some additional theorems and we have some additional theorems. Um, so we have some theorems telling us, it's not just the case that when you uh, abstract the code is correct, uh, when the per uh, when a programmer defines getters and setters, we get and set at the right places that we expect. Um, when you're doing high level verification, you're not using these proofs. So these are sanity proofs uh, to make sure our compiler is setting and getting at the right place. But basically, this layout thing just disappears at the lowest level of our um, abstraction. So basically, uh, the proofs from Cogen, uh, from C up to uh, the imperative semantics of Cogen. Uh, one thing people didn't ask me about is, well, you have these types. What if you specify layouts that do not match with these types? Like, for example, what if you say uh, the 32-bit um, integer uh, takes uh, only uh, one byte or one bit? Then the compiler will scream at you, rightfully so, and say you have a mismatch. you have a mismatch between your type and your layout. We also extended the uh, meta-theoretic proofs about the language to, um, to ensure that the 
uh, when the compiler accepts something, there's no mismatch between the type and the layout. Okay. Matt, who's sitting here, has contributed to early versions of implementation of Dargent. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, and yeah, Liam, of course, uh, <laughs> Cogent and Dargent. Uh, yeah. Okay, result in a nutshell. Okay, so what was I hoping for? I was hoping that once we develop all of this, people will implement all these healthy drivers in there. But then Australian government decided to uh, hire a bunch of people and, uh, or I don't know, like just ruin my lives and people's lives. Um, and um, yeah, so we verified a couple of small drivers that were written by category peers. Uh, I was impressed. Um, <laughs> Actually, I would love to impress by the quotient implementation because it's trivial, or quotient and Dargent implementation, because that was really trivial. The hard bit was to understand the C drivers, even though they weren't that big, uh, with the bit shifting and all the madness and uh, the specification that doesn't really uh, correspond to the code. And then reverse engineering, that was easy because uh, we didn't have to do any of the bit shifting. It was like, okay, so what you're doing is getting this field, getting this field, putting them together, adding three here, giving an output. The implementations were trivial. The verification of these small examples, but still verification, took a few hours. So each of these were verified. Their functional correctness was verified in a few hours. It took us a bit longer to understand the uh, spec and write the spec, but as soon as we had the spec, implementation and verification were trivial. I don't have big examples. No, I'm just talking about examples. Yeah, yeah. So I guess what you're saying is a lot of the bit shifting is just moving things around that you could easily do with a high level of abstraction. That gives you more space to think about actually clever bit shifting you could do at that level? Question. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. It gives you space to think about anything that's unnecessary. Like a lot of this code looks very fluffy, and it's not clear to me because I'm not a system programmer whether it needs to be that fluffy for any particular reason. Do you have impacts uh, system uh, engineers? That don't exist, uh, that uh, do not exist in Australia anymore? No, I'm sorry. Uh, we, we did not have much, like, so what I'm hoping to do with this is to collaborate with some systems folks and get them to try to implement drivers in the language and give us feedback. There are some things, oh, I had some initial, like before that uh, horror story happened, there was some initial feedback and there are some things I want to add. So we added engine to the language upon request, the big engine, little engine. To do things with that. Uh, we also have one that much hard that is much harder that we've been working on for a while, but um, reasonably decided to uh, make that step two of the project, which is so we added arrays natively to the language, but then uh, arrays and linear types uh, gets nightmarish. Um, but yeah, okay, we added arrays. So arrays of things that are not linear, at least that should be easy, and. Um, yeah, so, so so having arrays or also like these buffers, so arrays with where you have a tag and data and the size of the data depends on the size of the tag and no, not dependent types because that's too complicated for what we want to do with it. But, uh, 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 and, then, uh, and then extending that with specifying that abstractly on, uh, on a recursive data structure or uh, that would be cool. <laughs> So uh, I was working on such a data structure, not done, very far from finishing the verification. I'm still trying to understand like how the um, how to give it reasonable types in cogent or in a linearly type system uh, for, for this to be internally safe and also safe uh, with respect to uh, things out, outside of that structure. Just clarify for what I said. Um, what you're doing is you look at the C code and try and work out what the corresponding higher or the is that you write spec. Um, so we are spec. looking at the C code and also the spec of the C code, so the the manual that explains what this is supposed to do. Oh, the manual. Yeah. And uh, so like you know, what would be kind of cool is if you could look at the C code and see what the bit twiddling is doing, and then right. so what, is that what you're saying? That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. That would be nice. I think I was hoping for something less ambitious than that, which is basically um, getting in a Dargent specification and like getting rid of the glue. So, so you have some C surrounding C system. If people tell you how the data types are laid out for that system, um, with that information, 
uh, and you're saying these data types should correspond to these cogent data types in that way, you generate the dodgent layout. No, no, so that is a little bit less ambitious and like I'd be able to at least approach it, right? Yeah, um, it's very useful anyway. Yeah, yeah, so that would be nice. Um, there's a project in somewhere in Germany and Munich uh, going on that is reverse engineering C into Gojet. Pretty cool project. It's been going on for a while. Uh, it's been... No digents. <laughs> also, uh, uh, no groups uh, yet so about that reverse engineering. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. To follow up question on that. So if you have the two layouts, like on, on, this is how it starts, this is how it ends, there would be like a, a big design space, space of possibly correct ways of, of compiling something that does that. Do you explore that as well, or do you just take something that you can verify as correct and, and try? I'm oh, sorry, uh, uh, you mean like layouts that are not fully specified? No, if you have two fully, like fully specified yeah. layouts, if without them, yeah. then there's a big design space of possible ways of performing the so synthesis based on the layouts? Yeah. That is interesting, but no, we're not doing any synthesis. The people actually write the code and we're just compiling, right? So we're just compiling, we're just respecting their layouts. So we're not doing anything yeah. smart. We just take a fair bit shifting. So we're not doing the bit shifting. So they're uh sorry, um what what okay, so you have so they are specifying data structures and uh, like for inputs and outputs. And then when they write their functions, it's gonna be easier for them to write their functions because they can use the getters and setters that we're generating, right? Uh, or in other words, they could just use cogent. So they can just say set and get. So they don't have to do the bit shifting in the first place because the bit shifting is there, like in my opinion, that is the horrible way of doing what's in their head without the tools to do it. So for me, like that should not exist in the first place. Or that should be done by the compiler. It should be done by the compiler, exactly. So that should be automatic. If they really want to do it, they can use bits and cogent and knock themselves out. We do support bit shifting, but, uh, but that's not how I was hoping this would be used. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so that's that's basically it. A uh, lot of acknowledgements, a lot of people worked on that project. Um, these are some of them. Um, and yeah, uh, Ambrose Lafont, who's now in Cambridge, postdocing, following his postdoc in Sydney, is about is about like yeah, I think he's on the job market at this age. So uh, that is the category theorist, who's also an awesome engineer. <laughs> And wrote the device drivers and verified them on top of day. <laughs> um, other directions we explored or are exploring verified C implementation of array through Gojun's FFI. That was, um, we had that in CPT a year, two years, I don't know, uh, a year ago. Uh, I'm not very happy with this because uh, I think uh, the verification was a bit verbose. So the person doing it thought it was great. I don't think it's great. I think. I think it can be simplified a lot. Namely, <laughs> advertising for current projects, uh, I mean, uh, and collaborations. So uh, with linear types, you get this like notion of frame, right? Of what changes. So you're keeping track of resources intuitively. Let's not think about it too hard, but you're keeping track of what changes. Um, in separation logic, basically that's also a logic for reasoning about low level code, like imperative code. Uh, and it gives you uh, like maybe similar notion of frame of like just the frame that uh, tells you uh, that everything that you did not get, touch did not change. Our notion of frame and the notion of frame from separation logic are a bit different. And we're trying to understand that relation because when we were doing the C proofs, we did not use separation logic. We basically used higher order logic and we were on our own and the monadic C and we were on our own in between. I don't think that's ideal. I would love to be able to use separation logic uh, to reason about the C bits and have an automatic way of composing that with proofs that come from um, from uh, the type system. And that's work that also is involved in at the moment and was yeah hoping to do at some point in the past, I think. Uh, many other things, testing 
framework for cogent property-based testing. Uh, ah, but property-based testing of, uh, yeah, we're done. Okay, and a bunch of other uh, interest stuff. If you want to uh, broaden the interest stuff, uh, we have, a, phew, these are my broader interests. I have worked in some of these areas. Uh, if you're curious or like any of them, come talk to me about it. Um, yeah, okay. Thank you very much. So we have kind of used the question that we're going to help me ask, but if somebody has something that is it's important to the team, can uh, or uh, they well, you can. Yeah. When you start on this, see what's an obvious point, but now that the contenders like rest and go, I mean, what are you thinking about? I. Uh, I don't know much about Go. I know little about Rust. As in, like, I know something about a little bit about the type system, but not very much about the syntax. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it would be nice to understand if some of the uh, if some of the stuff we did here could be useful for Rust or for a Rust without borrowing or like. I, I just think Rust is so complicated. Like, there are ideas that that match, right? So they have the unsafe subset. The safe subset we have the c which is the unsafe subset in my opinion we have the cogent which is the safe subset understanding the interaction between the two um there's the ownership and threading and whatnot but like there are entire research groups that have been working for five years on understanding the relation between the safe and the unsafe subset entire other research groups that are working on uh, understanding the type system and formalizing it with the borrowing and whatnot so it is quite ambitious um if I at least have a formalized semantics of Rust in a theorem prover, I'm happy to try to compile down to that um, or start with that even and abstract that. Uh, but I just, I just like, yeah, I feel Rust is too uh, complicated for my taste. Uh, um, yeah, it would be nice to see if any of the results carry over. I'm more interested in whether there are relationships between uh, linear types and separation logic, uh, whether one could come up with logics that simplify the reasoning. Uh, another area I'm interested in is automatic theorem provers versus interactive. We get like a lot of good, like this whole community of people doing automatic theorem proving uh, and that kind of use separation logic, uh, whether there's a good interface to use these proofs and encode them in a way that can help us do further proofs like correctness. So I think that's at least my personal interest in that area. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. How much does that explain what type of key you can Right. Um, that's a good question. Um, I think it's just about writing the C in a very certain style. So basically in a very monadic style where you have the state and then you're, uh, so, uh, so every C code has a cogent type, right? So when you're writing it, you're not doing any proofs, but you have an idea. The type is encoding what's changing in the C. And then when you do the verification, you need to make sure that uh, that is indeed what's changing. So the C is, uh, respects the type that you give, is given. Uh, so I do think like there's a, it's not too bad to write the C in a way where it respects cogent uh, or the cogent type system. Uh, it, you just have to do it in a very specific style. <laughs> 